the signs that are all over every place uh, anticipating Vacation Bible School. Uh, we have registration forms or you can go online and register. Uh, register your neighbor's child. Register your neighbor. Uh, uh, we want to have a really great Bible school this year. And if you're interested in helping at all, please contact Anita or Cynthia. We are very excited about Bible school this year. It will be held in July, starting July 8th. Once again, we are so grateful you are here. Let us prepare our hearts for worship.
You may be seated. Father's Day is um, a, a day we honor the men who have helped to raise us, the ones that have raised us, uh, the ones that continue to raise us, even when they are no longer present. I know many of you uh, no longer have a father who is alive. I lost mine over 43 years ago, and I still miss him. And uh, I got an unusual email, or a series of unusual emails, asking me if uh, I didn't want to receive any emails regarding Father's Day. It seems now we've gotten so sensitive that we don't want anybody to hurt. And I didn't respond to that because I cried and cried and cried at many commercials on Father's Day, the Father's Day coming. And I love being reminded of my dad. And I love being reminded of all of his quirks. I love uh, being reminded of all the times that I irritated him and even the times that he irritated me. But I wouldn't be who I am without my dad. So hear this prayer for our fathers. Oh, holy God, sometimes Father's Day seems like a made-up day to sell cards, guides, and golf balls. And sometimes it's a day of great pain for fathers, sons, and daughters. Yet this day is so important because it is a reminder that being a father is a holy calling that is an honor, a privilege, and the most important job a man will ever have. So we pray today for fathers and for those who father everywhere. May they understand the awesome responsibility you have given them. And may they also come to know just how needed they are. Let them lean on your grace. Allow them to be healed of all pain and hurt. Enable them to love, and then love again, and then love yet again. Help them teach faith, courage, humility, compassion, integrity, and tenderness to their children, their children's children, and all those who have no fathers. We pray this in the holy name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.
So we have, uh, you have a piece of paper in your bulletin, and you are welcome to write questions that you might have about our theme for today, or you can go back and ask something from last week. Uh, we've had questions every week, which has been great. Uh, the question for this week um, was this. Science says Earth is millions of years old. And how does the creation story and the Bible match up with the facts of science? Uh, great question. Uh, how old, uh, what grade were we in when we started having our own science textbook? Anybody remember? Third grade. Third grade? Third grade. Uh, that science textbook uh, had something very specific about it and that every single thing in that science textbook had been tried and proven, had it not? Uh, the scientific method, which was developed uh, during the Age of Enlightenment, uh, that scientific method is uh, a proof. You do something and do something and it has a result. So if you take um, two atoms of hydrogen and combine them with an oxygen, you're going to get water. And you can try that experiment over and over and over and over and over again, and you're always going to get the same result. There is no faith required uh, in a science textbook. Every single thing in that science textbook can be proven no matter how many times you do that experiment. Our Bible is not a science textbook. Our Bible is something different. Our Bible is a book about faith. It's a book about theology. So let me just answer your little question. Uh, scientists tell us that they think the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. And that first was identified back in 1953 when a scientist took um, a meteorite that had fallen in Arizona some 50,000 years ago and actually did um, testing on it because it had uranium and different kinds of lead isotopes that can be dated. Uh, they've also gone with uh, zircon crystals. Um, that are found in Western Australia and in Western Greenland, about as opposite as you can get, and those tested 4.4 billion years old. Remember moon rocks? We all remember when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, they brought back moon rocks. They tested those moon rocks and they found uh, uh, similar kind of things that could be radio um, metric dating, and that was found to be 4.5 billion years old. Uh, but some people believe the bot that the Earth is only 6,000 years old, and you will hear that uh, from some people, and uh, uh, where did that number come from? That name, number came from an archbishop named James Usher that died in 1656. And where did he come up with that 6,000-year-old figure? He took the genealogies in the Bible. So he looked at the genealogies that were laid out and took the most extensive one. And he looked up, because a lot of those genealogies tell you how long somebody lived. And he added those all together, and he came up with the number 6,000. And so that's why some will tell you the earth, according to the Bible, is 6,000 years old, 
whereas the scientists will tell you it's 5.4 billion years old. And there's been other uh, proofs, according to the Bible, uh, of, of taking that. And in fact, uh, Bishop, Archbishop Usher gave us a specific date. It happened the evening before October 23rd, 4004 BC. That that was when time began. Now there's a problem with that, and, and for those that have studied the Bible or even compared genealogies, some people were left out of genealogies. You know, if you, you, you've got a uh, uncle that wasn't so hot, he was left out of the genealogies. And, and so they skip generations. So that can't be accurate to begin with. But let me just say um, that our Bible is a book that requires faith. It is not a science book. It's a book about faith. You can't run an experiment in the Bible and get everything to turn out the same way every single time. First of all, I have a feeling God would laugh at that. So it's not, one is not the same as the other. To take the Bible seriously requires faith. To take a science book seriously requires an understanding of scientific method. So they aren't the same. They were never meant to be the same. And uh, I love my Bible, but I take what I know from that Bible with faith in Jesus Christ and, the, and in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I hope that helped answer. I can give you a more extensive answer, but I have a sermon to do. So, um, but anyway, if you have another question, just let us know. Today we're going to be talking about providence. And yeah, I have my bungee cord here again because it's really important when we talk about providence to understand the spectrum that we deal with. And so the word providence means how does God work in the world? So here's the spectrum. There are people who believe that when God created the heavens and the earth, that God being omnipotent, omniscient, uh, omnipresent, that God controls everything. Right now, if your cell phone went off and it disrupted the whole congregation, a person that believes God directed that, that for some reason God caused that to happen. So that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum sees God as a divine watchmaker. In other words, he created this, he created time, he created this universe, and he created and set everything in motion, but he doesn't engage with creation any longer. So you see how you have one side of the spectrum and the other side of the spectrum? This says God's doesn't care, basically. That God has set it all in motion and God is not involved at all in history. Whereas this says that everything, everything, everything is God directed. Now, as, as every single one of us is somewhere along the spectrum. Now, I'm not going to criticize where you are. You are where you are. But I will tell you 
what we as United Methodists believe. And it's kind of this middle thing. But that kind of is who the Methodists are. It is, we're not going to sit there and tell you, you're wrong, you're wrong. We're in the middle and we're holding the tension of the two together. We believe that, yes, God has, God could do everything. But then we would just be robots and androids. And so today we're going to look at how we see God at work in the world. We also don't believe this end. We don't believe, we believe that God is active in salvation history and if our Bible is anything it tells us that story so those were the two spectrums are God controls everything God invented everything and then let it go so I'm going to read scripture today and it's uh, from one of my favorite chapters of the Bible uh, Romans 8 beginning with verse 22. We know that the whole creation is groaning together and suffering labor pains up until now. And it's not only creation. We ourselves who have the Spirit as the first crop of harvest also groan inside as we wait to be adopted and for our bodies to be set free. We were saved in hope. If we see what we hope for, that's not hope. Who hopes for what they already see? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit comes to help our weakness. We don't know what we should pray, but the Spirit himself pleads our case with unexpressed groans. The one who searches the heart knows how the Spirit thinks. Because he pleads for the saints consistent with God's will. We know that God works all things together for good. For the ones who love God. For those who are called according to his purpose. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Let us pray. May your scripture always be my delight, O Lord. May I not be deceived in them or deceived by them. Amen. Well, this is our third week in our series of what we believe, and uh, by now uh, you might understand that in college I was a music theory and literature major because the only way I recognize God or anything close to understanding God comes through my understanding of music. It's the closest thing to describe the Trinity. It is the closest thing to describe what happens to our hearts when we hear music. And and so when we talk about providence, there's two musical terms I want you to understand. So I've asked Cynthia uh, to stay at the piano or the organ so we can listen to them. The first thing I want you to understand is that music is driven by dissonance. So if you would play that C scale and stop on B, B, please. Now, how many of you can hear the next note? Yeah, we all hear the next note, don't we? That is the driving force oftentimes in music. It's that dissonance. And God, as a part of God's providence, created dissonance, created movement, something that drives us. Um, Now I'm going to ask you to play a, um, um, a discord. It's just a bunch of notes, is it not? It's not driving us anywhere. That was not part of creation. We came up with that all on our own. So there is a driving force in creation 
There is dissonance and there is discord. So dissonance is a part of creation, but discord is what happened when we took a bite of that apple and changed everything. Why did we take a bite of that apple? Because Adam and Eve listened to the serpent who said, you can be your own God. You can be in control. And for every single person in here who has tried to exert control and made a mess of things, you know what that discord is like, do you not? Discord always happens when someone says, I'm in control. So we're going to talk about what God did when God created this world. In our scripture, we find that God creates a world that groans. It is moving. It can move toward the good. It can also move toward the evil. And dissonance is a positive thing. Dissonance calls for some kind of resolution. A problem that can be solved. A need that arises that can be evaluated. A disease that can be cured. An injury that through therapy can be healed. Today, I'm listening to you, and I can actually hear you because I got hearing aids this week, and I discovered that I've been living in this silent world, <laughs> except for very loud noises, for a long time. I can hear my footsteps. I can hear the fans in my house. I can even hear the uh, air conditioner return. I don't, can't tell you the last time. So dissonance is this thing that moves through history and drives us. And God created that dissonance because God is moving with us through history. And if our Bible is anything, it provides us that plan book. Of God creating this universe to be in relationship with each other. And then someone saying, no, I, I want to be my own God. I don't want to be in relationship. And all of a sudden, everything starts becoming discord. Dissonance is when we know and see that there is an issue. And we work together to solve that issue. Dissonance is when something comes up in our life and, and, and it may be disastrous. And we pray and we beg God and, and God stays with us and moves us to a different place. Dissonance leads us as human beings to be problem solvers. Discord just leads to chaos. The second thing we need to understand about providence is that we are agents. We are agents in this salvation history. You get to make choices. I gave you a whole bunch of scriptures this week and work for today, all the way from Deuteronomy or Joshua, choose this day who you will serve. And we get to make choices. We get to choose whether we want to worship God or I want to do something else today. We get to choose how we treat one another and whether that will lead to movement or discord. We get choices in who we are going to serve in our life.
So whether you're a scientist, or a teacher, or a leader, or a zoologist, or someone, that, a farmer, you have agency in how you will work with God to further God's plan or not. So God has created dissonance to move our history, but God has also created agency for you and me. And God, when God creating agency for you and me, has intentionally stepped back and said, I'm going to limit what I will do to give you room to make choices. God doesn't force you to worship God. God doesn't force you to follow Jesus Christ. You get to make choices. Now, on this spectrum, we have people over here that said God has already made your choice for you. We as United Methodists don't believe that. You will also see people in this corner try to manipulate God. And folks, we are so wrong in doing that. You're not going to force God to do something God hadn't planned to do. So we have agency. Where we get confused is in this thing that is limited for us, but we don't fully understand. You see, when God created the heaven and earth, God created time. There is a time to God's planning. And man, we can't see it this close up. Let me give you a couple of examples. So ever ask the question, why did Jesus come when Jesus came? Why didn't he come earlier? Why didn't, why didn't he rescue them from the Greeks instead of the Romans? Or, or why, didn't, why didn't Jesus come and, and rescue them uh, during the Babylonian Empire? Why, or, or why didn't Jesus come later? If you wanted to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, what are two things you would have needed in that time period? Ellen, I know you know this answer. What was something unique about that time when Jesus was born? Well, there's two things. When the Greeks took over the known world, they created a common language. They insisted that everybody learn Greek. It didn't matter what you spoke before. You had to learn Greek in addition. So suddenly you had this common language, whereas Babylon had scattered all the languages, Greek became the universal language in the world. If Greece conquered you, which they did, you had to learn Greek. And then the Romans came along. What were the Romans famous for? Roads. I knew somebody would know that answer. Roads. Roads that went all across the known world. You no longer had to just go over a mountain on your own. There was a road for that. Roads all over the known world. 
roads in Europe, roads in London, or well, London didn't exist, roads in England, Scotland, roads everywhere. They built roads. So when the news of Jesus Christ started to spread, you had a common language where people could hear it, and you had roads. So missionaries could go out as far as the ends of the earth. That was the first time in history we had such a thing. And who did it? The Greeks and the Romans. So God sees what's happening in time and, and pulls out points of now this can happen, and now this can happen, and now this can happen. <coughs> Season four has come out on The Chosen, and maybe you're one of those lucky people who got to see it when it's in the theater six months ago, or, or you're watching it now uh, as it comes out of the app. Uh, I have ordered the DVD, so I've already uh, binged it twice. <coughs> and I don't want to blow anything except this story you already know uh, because it's in the Bible. But there is this great scene of Lazarus after he has been resurrected and Jesus. And we don't have anything of their conversation. And so they kind of put together this conversation that may have taken place. And, and there's all kinds of questions going on with the disciples because they know what Jesus can do and they see him do it sometimes and they don't see him do it other times. And they don't understand. Just like we don't always understand. And Jesus is telling Lazarus, you know, I don't know the Father's timeline. I knew the last sign, and it's a miracle in the Gospel of John, where he knew he would be doing so many miracles, and the last miracle was going to be a resurrection. But he said, I knew it would be the last one I did, but I didn't know who it would be. I had no idea it was going to be you. So God does have this plan. And we are part of this plan. But it doesn't fix everything for us. Because this plan, as Paul tells us, as the disciples tell us, as Jesus tells us, this plan requires faith. So I want to go back and use the phrase that some of you have already heard me say a thousand times. And it's from my systematic theology professor, Charles Wood, at Harvard School of Theology. God does not provide all things. God doesn't provide evil. God doesn't provide all the answers. God doesn't fix the consequences of what we've done on earth. If we mess up and do something stupid and there is a penalty or a price to pay for that in our community, God's not going to save us from that. We are going to meet the consequences of our bodies. We're going to meet the consequences of our decisions here on earth. But they no longer have an eternal consequence. That's what God's going to fix for you. So God doesn't provide all things, but God provides in all things. So every single one of us are going to have wonderful experiences, and we're going to have heartbreaks. We're going to have devastating heartbreaks. God didn't cause that heartbreak. That death of a loved one, that accident that 
took the life of someone we love. Or, but God provides in it. God will be with you. And maybe you'll get to the end of this earth and you won't understand, but you'll understand in time. And what you will notice, as Job noticed, let me remind you of that. Job's questions to God. Job never got the why. But when he experienced God firsthand, that was no longer important. He wasn't going to get his questions answered. But he saw that God cared. And that was enough. So no matter, matter where you are on the spectrum, know that we as United Methodists tend to be right here in the middle. We know that God provides. We know there's a plan. And ultimately, all we can tell you is that in the end, We will have maybe not what we want, but what we ultimately need. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. surprises how easy it is for us to focus on the big picture and forget that change comes in the smallest of ways in our hearts our spirits and only then in our actions we've gathered here today coming from different experiences to hear your word of healing love we offer our prayers for our friends and family members who are in need of your healing and forgiveness Yet we withhold ourselves from you. We have a hard time imagining that you would find much of real worth in each of us. We think of ourselves as insignificant in your kingdom, but you have poured your love on us. You've given us the seeds of hope and compassion. You have called us the treasure that is meant to enrich the world. So, holy God, help us be those people who are so confident in your presence that we dare to step out in faith, to work for you in places of need and strife, 
to witness to your love and all that we do, proclaiming your presence with our mouths and our actions. Give us your guidance, your forgiveness, and your courage to be at work in your kingdom. We pray this in the name that taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and our power, and the glory of heaven. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for each one of these wonderful people who love you and who love one another. So as we bring our gifts to you, bless the gift and the giver, and may they be used for your kingdom. Amen.
uh, next week, uh, as we go, we'll be talking about what we believe about humanity. And if you have any thoughts, you can let me know. Hear this benediction. May patience pay our path. May hope comfort our world. And may love guide our lives. Go with patience, hope, and love. <laughs>